Wait. Yeah, we're live. All right. Good afternoon. Good morning. Hello, everybody. Welcome back, friends. It's another Together at Home webcast from Buffet Crampon USA. My name is Matt Vance. I'm the Woodwind Product Specialist. I'm back in our webcast studio in Jacksonville, Florida at our North American headquarters. Welcome back and thank you for joining us this afternoon. I am thrilled to have our special guest uh, joining us live from the New York City area. She is a fantastic saxophonist. She's also a fantastic person. Lauren Sevian, welcome to Together at Home. How are you? I'm doing well, Matt. How are you doing? We're, we're doing okay. <laughs> You're interesting times. but Very but yeah. interesting indeed. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So now where, where are you joining us from today? You're in your apartment or where are yeah, you? Yeah, I'm joining you from my, um, my apartment here in the Riverdale section of the Bronx. Um, this is our office slash practice area. So, um, you know, this is the place where, you know, I get to come and be creative, you know, when my husband leaves the office. The office <laughs> so so this is where you've been living the last six months in that room right <laughs> <laughs> more or less you know this has been like this the recording studio the practice space you know the composition area um yeah you know yeah, yeah it's it's an interesting time i one thing we we like to talk to to all our guests about and you and i talked about this before we we went live is um, finding out what our artists have been up to since everything changed back in March. And of course, in New York, um, New York got hit a little bit earlier and, and a lot harder than other parts of the country. So what was that like for you as far as, as, as a, a busy professional musician in the New York area when everything stopped? Um, you know, personally, it was difficult. Um, I had a lot of activity coming up in terms of gigs and, and traveling and, and things like that. Um, and also a lot of gigs in town and teaching and things and everything just basically came to a screeching halt, you know, and, and, you know, really our, our priority shifted to almost this kind of survival mode, you know, and in, in March in New York, the weather is usually not the best. So most people in general, and myself included, just trying to stay inside. I mean, getting outdoors, obviously, for fresh air and stuff. And I mean, I, I for me, it's like I, I'm, a, I'm a big runner, so I enjoy being outside and, you know, spending time outside. But in a lot of ways, it just almost felt like, yeah, you shouldn't, you know, it's, it's, it's almost dangerous in a way to go outside at, at this point, you know. So you kind of pick and chose, like, what, you know, certain times that you would go out and, go about your business but yeah it was it, I mean it's, it was and still is very um, very difficult because it just was such a shock I think you know just one by one things getting canceled you know and and to get like calls and emails and sometimes like multiple ones in in one day is you know it just every time it happened you just felt like wow, the, the reality of what was happening was being pounded into you as far as, you know, what career-wise what was happening and what was ha the scene, what was happening on the scene. But at the same time, you're, you know, you're dealing with a very dangerous virus, you know. So you, you I think human beings, we just, you know, you switch into this survival mode and it, the focus becomes more about, like, how can I protect myself and my family and my, you know, my friends. And, and part of that was, you know, staying at home and being diligent and just, and trying to follow the, the advice of scientists as much as possible, you know, and sadly that human connection was really yanked away uh, quite abruptly. And that can be very, I think, especially for, for us as musicians, a big part, big component of what we do is the social aspect, you know? So to suddenly not have that is very, it's, it's shocking, you know? Yeah. Well, and you were doubly impacted too, not only in terms of performing, but also in terms of teaching, you know, your students not getting that regular weekly interaction or even daily interaction with some of them that, that was yeah. probably doubly hard on you, right? Yeah, it's, you know, it, 
it's it's weird because it's not not to say that you take it for granted but when it's when you when you don't have that you just feel like there's an emptiness you know and you have to figure out like how how to how to deal with that you know yes. so it's definitely you know the universe is trying to tell us something and it's really up to us whether or not we want to listen and for me i felt like okay this is a good time to be introspective and to try to think outside of the box at the same time like what can i do to keep myself sane and creative and um you know thinking about the future and not trying to dwell but so much on the negative because it's really being you know drilled into us every day yeah. and being really thankful for the fact that I have a home and that I have, you know, food on the table and I'm very lucky and, you know, feeling grateful for all those things because so many people are suffering so terribly right now, you know? Yeah. So I was, you know, I'm still, I'm trying to figure out what is it, like, how can I help? You know, that's really what I'm, you know, trying to do and trying to figure out. And a lot of it is just, you know, speaking to people and listening and just, you know, reassuring each other that we're not alone in this, you know? Yeah, definitely. And I think that's one of the nice things. Well, when we started this webcast series back in April, um, I, I think, I think you made a very good point about, you know, the initial shock of, of, and it seemed very abrupt, at least down here sure. to where everything just stopped. And so once you get over that initial shock and you start thinking about things in a different way, okay, well, how can I make the best of the situation and see if I can get back to some sort of social normalcy? Yeah. And that's actually one of the cool things about, about what you and I are doing today is the fact that, you know, we're able to sit here and talk and, and, uh, and it's, it's kind of cool. It's something that I think we wouldn't have thought about before all of this. That's and true. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I, I think I think it's important for us to focus on on some of the good things that have happened since this this kicked in. Of course, you've been very busy, even with everything shutting down. You've, you've had a lot of nice accolades in in the last year or so, and you've been very busy both with performing and, and with teaching. Um, one of the things that I wanted to get into um, was the fact that you you had an accolade uh, in 2019, a couple of accolades actually with the Rising Star Award from Downbeat Magazine, which I know you've been nominated for that before and, and you were awarded with that last year. Also the Hot House Jazz Awards. Those are two, I think, really significant awards just in general, but, but the fact that women are making more and more inroads in jazz and, you know, in, in a... a music genre that has often been associated with with men and the fact that you are shattering a lot of those uh preconceived notions and the fact that now you're winning these these high level awards i think is extraordinary maybe you could talk a little bit about that well thanks matt i i mean it's 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 really a, a it's an honor you know to just to be recognized i'm i'm really like real again very grateful um for you know being able to, to for being the recip recipient of those awards um i've you know i've been in new york city a, a really long time and i feel like i've worked really hard so to have that that you know that kind of recognition is very very special to me you know and i really really appreciate it and um it again it you know it was it's just a nice it's a really nice gesture and either way you know I'm you know you're always going to keep creating and keep making music but to have the recognition is is really really nice and I I cherish it very much well I think well I'm sure a lot of a lot of people that are tuning in today they're familiar with how di diverse your performances uh, your performance opportunities are not only with playing Barry in the in the Mingus band, um, your experience going back all the way to when you moved to the to the city in 1997, um, your own groups, 
um, you've got you've got your your hands in a lot of different pots, and and I think um, I think that really speaks to not only the the world class player that you are, but also that you've got that drive that you're really striving to do a lot of different things and and to get into a lot of different playing opportunities. And and I think that's that's one thing. Well, I think the, the awards recognize that hard work on your part, but I think it also speaks to to the fact that you are a diverse player and, and you're able to work with a lot of different people. Yeah, it's something I really always strove to do um, was to really was to connect with as many musicians as possible. I really enjoy the variety of the different types of work that I get to do. Um, I love playing in big bands. I love playing in small groups. I love, you know, playing in horn sections. It, for me, it's if I have the if I have the saxophone in my hand, I'm I'm happy, you know. So um, part of my plan and still is my plan is just to be in as many different types of musical situations as as possible, you know. Yeah. Okay. Uh, if you're just joining us this afternoon, we're being, um, we have Lauren Sevian as our guest on today's Together at Home webcast. She's joining us from the Bronx in New York City. Uh, it is great to have Lauren joining us. Of course, she is a Buffet Crampon saxophone artist. She plays the 400 series baritone saxophone. You've seen her in the Mingus band. You've seen her with her quartet and her quintet. Uh, she's also uh part of a new group that we'll talk about in a minute called Lioness, which I'm, I'm very excited to learn about as well. Um, you, you came to New York in 1997 as a student, um, but you almost immediately became a, a gigging, working musician in the New York scene. What, what was that like for you to, to get into the scene at, at a pretty early age and, and begin working almost immediately? Um, it was just fun, you know, I, I remember my first road trip, um, being with the Diva Jazz Orchestra and to be in that environment was just a lot of fun and, um, just great music and, and great times. And I was, I was so young and I was just soaking up everything you know just from the the plane rides <laughs> to the what was happening on the gigs it's back when it was cool right after the, yeah no <laughs> i never thought about nobody yeah before well pre 9 11 um bringing an instrument on the plane was definitely a much easier task than it is nowadays yeah. um we'll see how it how it goes once we get past this pandemic um but it was just so fun and it was just so great to, again, for me, it's about the connections and, and the community and connecting with people and making great music. And it, it really was so, so inspiring. And I was very fortunate to start working while I was in school. So I was able to have this, the foundation of the school experience and also the practical real world experience of being a traveling musician, which is ultimately, which was ultimate, is ultimately my goal, you know? and was ultimately, ultimately my goal. Yeah. Um, we've got a couple of people tuning in this afternoon. Uh, Lori Orr, who's just not too far from you. She's saying yeah. hello. Hi, Lori. Yeah, Chris Coppinger also is chiming Hi. in to say hello. Hey, Chris. Yeah, I think he's driving out to the end of Long Island to play golf this afternoon. Uh, not, well, watch out for the weather. It's not the best in New York today. Oh, no, really? <laughs> I don't know, Chris. Might not. Might might play a couple couple rounds and that's. Yeah, it. I, I don't think Chris really cares, but <laughs> just for the experience. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. Um, let's see. We've got uh, Alex Terrier is joining us this hey, afternoon. Alex. Alex, thank you for joining us. Of course, hey. Alex is another buffet crumpon saxophone artist as well as Kyle Worth. Alex actually says that you might want to crank up the gain on your microphone a little bit. Ooh, okay. Well. Thank you for that, Alex. All right. Is that better? 
Yeah, it, it, that sounds good. Yeah. Okay, I'm just gonna. I'm before I play, I'll have to turn it down again. Otherwise, it's no. Gonna, you don't <laughs> really blast away. <laughs> so we've got a lot of people tuning in. Luke Pinella, who's our uh, technician at the Buffet Crump on New York showroom, uh, says to tell you hello from Long Hi. Island. Hi. Ah, oh, hello, Luke. You know, we've got a lot of friends tuning in this afternoon. Sure. Alonzo Wright is also tuning in and says, "Hi, Alonzo." El Boogie. <laughs> I don't know if that's I'm going to ask you about the the origin of that that nickname. Oh, that's a great that's a good story. We can well, why don't you share it with us? Oh, okay, well, um, uh, you know the saxophonist Jaleel Shaw. He's a really good friend of mine, and um, he, you know, we start. He's kind of dubbed me that, like my nickname was El Boogie. You know, and then I have another friend, um, trumpet player Nabate Isles, who also calls me El Boogie was calling me El Boogie and then it just it started to stick and then I made my Facebook my profile um El Boogie <laughs> just to just for fun um when and this was several years ago like I had gone off Facebook and then I came back on and I thought it'd be funny to come back I'm a little bit of a jokester so um I thought it would be funny to come back on as El Boogie and then try to friend request people who were my actual friends but i was wearing a like a disguise not well, really a I disguise yeah. but you might remember you know i was i was wearing a sombrero and and these huge sunglasses so i thought it'd be funny to friend people and that's all you saw as a profile picture so i thought it'd be fun to you know try to friend people and then if they didn't accept my friend request i i'd i'd you know i'd i'd call them up and be like i'm really mad at you you know <laughs> like why what i do like, you weren't, wouldn't accept my friend request, you know? <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, I don't know. <laughs> it's kind of silly. And they'd be like, oh, that was you? <laughs> you know? So that's where El Boogie came from, and it just kind of stuck. So yeah, it's actually, fun. When, when I see your real name pop up on Facebook, I'm like, oh, wait, who's that? What? <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, right. And now, and now, and then when I got, when I got married, I, you know, I, I didn't legally take my husband's name, but on Facebook, I, you know, I changed it to El Boogie Wright, you know, so. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just having, just having fun, you know. Yeah, yeah, no, I dig it. Um, one of the things I want to talk to you about this afternoon, um, and we'll get to some more of the questions. We've got some questions coming in. We appreciate everybody joining us this afternoon. Um, you started playing buffet crump on saxophones, and, and Declan Lynch, who's our producer today, he and I were we're discussing this before we went live. You know, I think you joined our roster of artists in the late 2000s. Yeah. Yeah. So I, which kind of blew my mind because I'm like, wow, she's, she's been with us a long time playing the 400 series Barry. Yeah. And, and I was, and I was thinking back to, to when you first got on our instruments because you were, you were playing a vintage baritone before that. Um, maybe could you talk a little bit about about the evolution into getting into the 400 series baritone from where you were before? Sure. So I, you know, I had been playing on a Selmer Mark VI for really the entire time I had been serious about playing the baritone. So, and that was the instrument my, you know, my father made a deal with me if I, you know, if I got into music school, he would get, you know, get me a berry of my own because I was using the school's berry, you know. And I said, okay. So I got into school. <laughs> the bribe worked. Um, <laughs> and, you know, I played on that horn from, so from 1997 up until, I guess it was like probably 2008 when I joined Buffet, maybe around 2008, 2009. Yeah. Um, let me think about this. I, I want to say it was 2009, you know, 2009 or 2010. But it's it's been at least, it's been 10 years for sure. Yeah. Um, and it was actually, I think it was, it was, it was actually Greg Osby that had suggested to me to try the buffets because he said, you know, you guys had just, I think really just said, correct me if I'm wrong, but at that point you had just started to make the saxophones again, you know? Yeah, the, the 400 series was introduced in 2006, but it, yeah. that was, that was around the time around 2008, 2009, where we were really starting to get some, some traction and, and people were starting to notice the, the saxophones in the mainstream market. Yeah. Yeah. And I was, um, 
you know, I was curious about playing a new horn because I really had never spent a lot of time playing a new horn. Even though I really love my Selmer, I felt like there were things on it, things with the horn mechanically that were just limiting for me in order for me to push to the next level that I wanted to get to. I just, I really felt the need like, okay, I just, I need to try, I need to try a new horn, a, a new horn. And I had always been like, oh, I'm, I'm a vintage horn. I'm a Mark six, you know, I'll never play anything else. But I, I also felt like I should be open to, you know, just trying, trying something new and trying something different. And then when, as soon as I tried the horns, I was like, wow, you know, it's <laughs> just to, to play something that's, you know, I just felt like for me, the accuracy of, you know, the intonation and the way the horn felt in the way that the horn felt to me, it was similar, just ergonomically similar to my Selmer, you know, so I don't, I didn't feel like there was a lot of stuff I had to change as far as, you know, my finger placement and things like that, you know, and, but I also felt, I felt like I could fill the horn up a lot better versus with the Selmer. I just felt like, um, it just was really, it was getting to the point for me where it was just really difficult to project, you know, like the sound was great, but I just felt like I had no control over my volume, you mm. know, and, and if I tried to play louder, it just, the sound became too harsh, you know, and I really need a saxophone that's, that works in all situations, you know, like I can't just play one way. Like if I'm playing in a horn section with Dennis Leary versus playing in the Mingus band, you know, it's just a different, you know, these are different environments. So I need a horn that's going to be able to fit those environments. And the same way, if I'm playing with my quartet or quintet, you know, it's, I, I need something that's versatile enough, you know, to fit all those situations. And for me, the buffet was that saxophone, you know, and I've tried many different types, uh, many, you know, new horns. I've tried a lot of them, but for me, it's the buffet, you know. I'm going to put you on the spot in a minute and have you play for us a little bit, because I know people want to, me to stop talking and listen to you play. <laughs> but um, as, as someone that plays a lot of baritone myself, one of the things that I noticed right away when I started, started playing my four hundred series baritone was the tuning on the instrument. Yep. Um, the the previous baritone that i that i had um was a great instrument but the tuning especially in the upper register i had to i had to do a lot of weird things in order to get it to play into is that something that you experience you're shaking your head so yeah I, i'm just like yep 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 i you know the palm key is the upper register like i like to play you know sometimes up in the stratosphere and it was just really such a challenge you know, for me and just every single note, I had to adjust the intonation and it just got like, it got kind of tiresome, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That was, that was one thing. And, and I think for me, at least I had to almost rethink how to play in the upper register because I was so used to having to get those notes to play in tune, you know, they yep. would play really sharp and then I would have to you know, use short fingerings or that kind of thing. So um, yeah. would, would you mind playing a little bit for us? And then we can talk sure. a little bit more about your baritone. Sure. Cool. Yeah. So we had talked about uh, moaning the other day. Oh, yeah. So if I wouldn't mind playing that, I'll play a little bit of it. <laughs> that would be phenomenal. I know people would love to hear you do that. Yeah, I miss playing it. I mean, it's weird all these years. having. Yeah, you're probably it. not sick of it anymore, aren't you? <laughs> I know. I, like, I'm like. <laughs> When you asked me, do you want to play Mona? I was, I was secretly like, oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Any other time I might've been like, no, <laughs> it's still fun. I mean, as a Barry player, it's just a tune that everybody, you know, everybody knows. So I'll play a yeah. little bit and I'll play around with the melody. Cool. Cool. Thank you. 
Yeah. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> I yeah, saw the you... dial was going red, so I don't know if it was distorting <laughs> like crazy. <laughs> no, no, I wasn't red. It was just going red figuratively because it was so hot. That's what it was. <laughs> That was beautiful. Thank you for doing that. Sure. And, and I think that that's such a great choice to show the the evenness and the versatility of the instrument. The fact that you're able to play, you know, when you were playing out front before you got into the line, you're playing in the upper register and everything. You're able to hear that evenness of the intonation and, and the response and everything. And yeah, 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 it sounds terrific. Thanks. Now, Alex Terrier had a really interesting question that, um, I think a lot of people uh, maybe don't realize, and I think a lot of saxophonists are interested in this, is the fact that there are still people that, and especially around New York, that play low B flat baritones. Mm -hmm. um, and if you're not that familiar with baritone saxophones, um, there, there are two different designs. There's a low B flat version, which has got the traditional bell length, and then you have a low A version, which we've got one here. So the bell's extended a little bit. Um, for you, what what's your experience playing between those two instruments in terms of how, I mean, do, do they play differently? Are they different? Um, you know, for me, I haven't spent too much time playing a low B flat baritone because I had started on a low A baritone. And really when I started out playing baritone, I was doing a lot of funk gigs and stuff. So I really had to have that low A berry. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it actually was, I think I had tried the first low B flat berry I had tried was a Kyle Worth. And I really loved it, you know, and I was like, oh, this is, this is kind of cool, you know. But then I played, I think it was the Shadow, was it called, was it? The, the Shadow finish for Kyle Worth, yeah. Yeah, and the low A one. And that baritone, I was like, I, actually, it was funny because that was many years ago. And I almost wound up buying that one, you know. Mm -hmm. I, I, I changed my mind last minute, but that one compared for me compared to the B flat I just I still like the low A I don't know what it is I just for me there's something um just a little bit power more powerful about it you know and um some people do consider the B flat horns like more of a solo instrument but I think that you can manipulate the low A baritone so that it you know fits that criteria a little bit more whether it's with your setup or you know um but i i know a lot of people that do just play low b flat horns and love them you know so i i, I feel like it's a very personal thing but for me it's always been i've always been a low a gal <laughs> yeah know? yeah uh if you're just joining us this afternoon we have a special guest with us on uh today's together at home webcast uh, Buffet Grandpon baritone saxophone artist Lauren Seven, Lauren Sevian, sorry, is joining us from the Bronx in New York City. Um, she is taking your questions via the comment section on today's uh, live webcast. So if you have a question for Lauren, please, uh, please put that in. We'd love to hear from you and uh, we are taking questions live. Uh, Lauren, our president and CEO, Francois Clock sends hey. his greetings. Hi, Francois. Yeah, so How he's, are you? he's here in the office today and he's watching. So it's great to have awesome. Francois joining us. Also, uh, Donnie Todd, who's our division manager in the Southeast United States. He's checking in and says to tell you hello. Hi, we've, Donnie. Uh, we've got a lot of people joining us. Dan Morris uh, says to tell you hello this afternoon. Hello. Yeah, so a uh, lot, lot of people checking things out. Um, let's talk a little bit more about uh, when, when you mentioned uh, the low A baritone versus the low B flat baritone. You said a lot of people like the low B flat baritone more for small group stuff, but you do a lot of small group playing with your quartet and your quintet. And now with, with the lioness group, which is a little bit larger group, but it's still not a big band. Yeah. You're able to make a low A horn work in those situations. Uh, maybe yeah. talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, I just, I think again, for me, it's because I've always played a low A horn and I, you know, it almost, I mean, it really never even occurred to me to play a low B flat horn. I, I did have one teacher many years ago try to get me to switch to a con and I was, I was like, no, no, I don't want to do that. <laughs> I mean, I try, I remember trying, trying his and I said, nope, I'm not. But I know a lot of people that love their cons and will only play cons. And I, I think that's great, you know, 
Um, so for me, it was, you know, sometimes it's a little bit of like, you might have to back off a little bit. You might have to, you know, again, work with your, your setup, you know, and manipulating that can enable you to, to, you know, I guess have more of a, like, you know, it's, a, a, you know, a, a horn that's going to be better situated for a solo situ, you know, a solo, you know, quartet or, or quintet or what a small group situation. But again, you know, I, I do feel uh, strongly that the buffet horn meets all of those like, criteria, you know, but it's a personal thing where you just kind of adjust a little bit in terms of what the plan is. And with Lioness, um, the front line is, it's all, it's, it's alto tenor berry is the front line, you know, it's all saxophones. Um, and then it's organ, guitar, and drums. So a big thing is really, um, you know, being able to blend in that, in that situation and not really, and not overpower and, and not, um, and, and also being heard too, at the same time, you know. Well, and I think that's one of the, the cool things about a baritone in a small group, especially when you have a front line like that, is that you actually have different roles. You have, uh, you know, like when, when you're playing Mona and you're, you're out front and you're really, you're really kind of stepping on the gas, but then you also have the responsibility of being able to blend with the alto and the tenor, Yeah. Uh, just like in a big band saxophone section. Um, is, is there something maybe that you could play for us this afternoon that would would we we've seen what the baritone can do as far as really you know being being strong with with the intro to Monin. maybe something that's a little a little more pulled back more small group to where you can show that versatility sure yeah so i mean i could play a ballad or you know just just so you could you know that would be cool that'd be like the biggest difference between <laughs> Monin <laughs> and you know just so you can hear like the softer side yeah if you wouldn't mind that'd be great so you can, like manipulate it okay That was um uh con alma and i just you know is it is a tune i play a lot you know in um different small group situations so you know just to, so you could see the contrast between like you can do something like moaning but there there's a lot of nuance in the sound of the horn that enables you to play like in different with different types of timbre and and tone you know yeah, that was beautiful. That was a great yeah, example. Thanks. Sounds sounds terrific. Thank you. Uh, we got a lot of questions coming in this afternoon. Cool. Um, Dan Morris has a really interesting question. Um, Lauren, what makes the Mingus Band sound so unique and exciting? And he's also asking about your approach as far as um, blending with the, uh, the bass drum. 
splinting with the bass trombone. Um, you know, as a berry player, you have to do that quite a bit. So mm -hmm. what, uh, I, let's talk about the Mingus band question first. What makes that Mingus band sound, because it is a very different sound than other big bands that, that you would hear. What, what makes that Mingus band sound different? I mean, honestly, well, first of all, the, the compositions, you know, of Charles Mingus are so powerful in and of themselves. And interesting to note that Charles Mingus never had his own big band, you know, but what's what's kind of interesting to me is that a lot of people know about the Mingus big band before they actually know who Charles Mingus is, mm -hmm. you know. So the other part of that, I think, is the musicians that play the music and express it the way that they personally express it is a really big, big part of that of that group you know, um, is, is really, it's the players, it's the people, you know, and it's the combination of certain people. And you have this, this type of chemistry that, you know, makes it so unique and special as far as the sound goes, you know, that's, that's kind of, that's, that's my viewpoint. Yeah. A lot it. of different personalities yeah. that come together. Yeah. Personalities, energies, you know, yeah. Um, boisterous and loud and fun, but also can be also introverted and calm, you know. Okay. So, and and you know, if if you've seen the the band perform live ever, you you can really experience the different highs and lows of 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 the performance, you know. Yeah, it's quite an experience hearing that band live. I mean, the the energy. Um, and as you mentioned, I hadn't really thought about that, the highs and lows in the performance. It's, it's really, it's, a, it's an experience that everyone needs to, to have because it's very, very different hearing that band live than hearing recordings of the band. Yeah. 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 Dan's other question was, um, can you describe how you approach blending with the saxes versus the bass trombone? Which, yeah, because yeah, basically you do have two different roles. Yeah, a lot of it depends on what's going on in the music, you know, because a lot of the times I am with the bass trombone and a lot of times I'm with the saxophone. So I have to know the music so well to the point where I I can, you know, act more. Because in my mind, when I'm playing with the bass trombone, I'm blending with the bass trombone. I really want it to sound like one sound. I don't want it to sound like Barry overpowering bass trombone or bass trombone overpowering, overpowering Barry. You know, so a lot of the time I'll listen to the player and also I know a lot of, uh, I do know a fair amount of bass trombone players and I know their particular styles. So, you know, I, a lot of the time I will try, I will really try to adjust to where they're at, whether it's, you know, trying to, to blend more or balance or, you know, adjust my tone so that it, you know, it, so that it's not, um, so that there's not so much conflict, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and then, and phrasing too, you know? I, for me, I will usually, you know, I will defer to the, the bass trombonist and listen to how they're phrasing stuff, you know? Because the way that I see it, I, I mean, I'm, I'm sitting in front of them, you know? So it's a lot easier for me to just, for me to hear them than it is for them to hear me. Sure. You dig what I'm saying? So I, and I, I, you know, I prefer to be, to try to phrase with, with how they're phrasing things, you know, yeah. versus, you know, just phrasing something completely differently. And then sometimes, you know, you, you like, if it is a part that's, you know, really exposed or important, you know, you, you'll just have a conversation about it real quick. Be like, yeah, should we play it like this? Or, you know, and then, and you, you know, and work it out that way. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Um, Donnie Todd, who we mentioned earlier is joining us from South Carolina this afternoon. He has a, an interesting question that I, I know you have a perspective on. He's asking about the difference in the two finishes of the mm. 400 series baritone. Um, all the 400 series saxophones come in either uh, a traditional lacquer finish or the matte finish or the antique finish as somebody uh, some people refer to. And I know you played on the, the matte finish baritone for a while, but you're playing on a lacquer baritone now. 
Yeah. Um, maybe talk a little bit about why you decided to make that switch. Yeah, so I did start out on the um, on the matte finish horn, and um, I played on it pretty steadily for about I would say six months, and then I started to feel like I just I wanted um, I wanted to have a little bit more edge, and then I decided to go back and try. The, the lacquer horn again and that's when I decided to make the switch because I just was looking just for that little bit more edge not that the matte finish horn can't be edgy because it can but I just felt like um, you know I, I felt like let me just try the lacquer horn just to see you know and I, I actually still have the matte finish horn I, I use that horn as as like my my the horn that I take on the on the road usually you know um, and I will use my the neck from this horn to, oh. you know, just to add like just a little bit more edge because I, I mean, I like to play with a lot of edge. <laughs> so that's honestly why um, I wound up moving to the to the lacquer horn. Mm -hmm. It just had a, that, that little extra bit of brightness that I was really looking for. Yeah. Um, you, you mentioned traveling with a baritone. Um, and you, we talked a little bit about flying earlier and what a nightmare that can be, especially if you're trying to carry one on the plane. Oh, yeah. um, a lot of people tuning in this afternoon, um, there, there may be some music educators joining us. And we all know the terrible, terrible things that happen to baritone saxophones in school band rooms. Um, yeah. <laughs> and... Uh, I'm being kind of funny, but I'm not because it's a really large, heavy instrument. And if you have it in a middle school or even a high school, the kids aren't necessarily going to take the best care of it. Um, one of the things that people seem to really like about these instruments, and I think you can talk about it from a, a unique perspective, traveling as much as you do, when you do have to take a baritone out on the road and you have to take it on a plane or on a bus, um, What's your experience with the 400 series as far as the durability of the horn? I mean, the, I, like to just to put it this way, the horn really can take a beating. Like <laughs> I, I've, I've, tr I mean, part of the reason why I started taking the matte finish horn on the road with me was just because, like, uh, the the lacquer horn. Not that I didn't want to, like, not that I didn't want to mess it up, but at the same time, I was just, I've, I've. I've tweaked it so that, you know, if something happened to it, I would be like, oh, man, you know, um, I almost, you know, I, I, I almost think that like the matte finish horn, it was, it's, it's, it's in slightly better condition because like, I mean, this is like my New York horn. I'm taking, you know, taking it on a subway and I got a gig, gig bag and, you know, just scratches all over it, you know, from <laughs> my bracelets and stuff. <laughs> um, and the, um, I mean, the matte finish horn, I, it's, it's, it's really such a beast, you know, I clamp the keys down. I, I have a, um, uh, a Mike Manning uh, custom case that um, I, I've, I've gate checked it many times, you know, and as far as the durability of the horn is concerned inside of that case, I've had, I've had no problems. I've never checked it on the baggage belt. I just won't, I won't do that. You know, and you know me, I'm, you know, <laughs> I'm asking you, I've, I've played your horn before, Matt. Yeah, that's <laughs> <know>? right. <laughs> <laughs> at that, uh, at, um, you know, you know, several times, I think. So, yeah. um, I, it's, it's tough traveling with a berry. Uh, the best thing you can do is to try to get something that's really protective in the, in the situation. I think if I was forced to, to check that, that Mike Manning case, you know, I think it would be okay, but it's, you know, it's, it's, it's yeah, something you, you want to avoid, that. you know, yeah. and, and honestly, like the gate checking thing, especially if you're just, you know, traveling domestic is really, is it's super, I almost prefer that that way. I don't have to like push the horn up into the overhead, 
mm. you know, and is really all they're doing is carrying it downstairs and carrying it back upstairs. The key is that you want to make sure it's not going to go to the baggage claim. That's what you have to tell them when you gate check it at the at the gate. You know, you have to make sure that it's going to come up with, you know, the strollers and, and people's, you know, gate checked luggage, you know, and and I, I know to this point, I know like certain airports, they don't do gate checking, you know, so I, I have to, you know, I have to plan really well for those, you know, those those kinds of situations. But as far as the horn is concerned and the durability of it is, I mean, it's, it's amazing. I mean, and I've had this horn for, you know, with definitely 10 plus years and I can count on both hands how many times I've had it worked on. You know, wow. not not very much, you yeah. know, not not very much. And, and a, many of those times was human error. So <laughs> 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 I won't have to, I won't get into that. <laughs> we, won't, we won't talk about which. <laughs> yeah. um, you're uh, you're you're tuning in this afternoon. If you're just joining us, so we have our special guest, Lauren Sevian, joining us from New York City. She's a buffet crampon baritone saxophone artist. She plays the 400 series lacquer horn it is our pleasure to have lauren joining us this afternoon um i want to get into um some of the educational things that you have been involved with and and these are actually some pretty at least one of them is a recent development um with nasa uh, the north american saxophone alliance uh, which actually it's ironic that was the last travel experience i had before everything shut down i was out at the nasa conference in uh, tempe arizona Mm. Um, which was a really great hang. A lot of, a lot of good saxophone friends out there and we had a really good turnout. And when I learned about your involvement in their new mentoring program uh, the other day, I was very excited because I think that, I think that's a match made in heaven. I think it's a, a great program for the times that we are living in, but also the fact that they have you involved in this program and your educational background uh, working with jazz at Lincoln Center, uh, teaching uh, at camps uh, throughout the year. Maybe could you talk a little bit about your involvement in this new NASA mentoring program? Well, yeah, I, about um, it might have been a couple of weeks ago that um, uh, Jan Barry Baker had reached out to me about about doing the mentoring program, and it sounded it sounded wonderful. And I said I'd, I'd love to do it. You know, so I think. Um, I think within the next month or so, we're we're supposed to have our first meeting and and I think discuss you know the overview of the program. Um, but from what I understand, so is myself and several other um, female um, musicians, female saxophonists that are going to be mentors. Just to mention a few, so Alexa Tarantino, Camille Thurman, um, Lee Pilzer. Um, and there's uh, there are some some ladies that I'm looking forward to meeting, um, but I think it's about it's maybe ten to twelve mentors, and we'll be paired up with somebody, and they have um, we'll be working with them in terms of developing a uh, project, whether it's a community based project, education project. So, and I, I believe we'll be working with them throughout the rest of this year into next. So I'm I'm really looking forward to it. it should be should be a really wonderful experience. Do you know what the age group of the, the students will be? I have to double check on what the age group is, but it's, you know, it's definitely, um, it's definitely high school. Um, there are the complete details of if you, there's like a link, um, if you go to their website, it, it, it discusses the program in, in, um, in total, total detail. Very cool. So if you're a young lady watching this, please head to the NASA website and, you know, and check it out and apply. And it is specifically for young lady jazz musicians. Mm -hmm. Is it just for saxophonists or is it? For, no, yeah. it is just for saxophonists. Well, it's through NASA. Of course it is. Yeah. No, that's very cool. Yeah. And I think Declan is going to try and put a link up on the uh, comment section if people want to check that out. Um, you're also involved in the middle school jazz academy. Mm -hmm. uh, through Jazz at Lincoln Center. Mm -hmm. um, and I know you've done other uh, age levels all the way through college groups coming through Jazz at Lincoln Center, but specifically working with middle school kids. Um, first of all, my hat's off to you, my hair's off to you too, because mm -hmm. working with middle school kids, as my wife will tell you, is very, very challenging. 
Um, and I think it's extraordinary that you are specifically working with middle school kids, um, not only on playing your instrument, but specifically on jazz. Um, what, what drew you to that program and, and what do you like about working with kids in that, in that age group? Um, well, I, I do feel like, you know, especially a lot of them are, are really, you know, only been playing for maybe two to three years. You know, for me, I, I really enjoy working with students that I can catch them early and try to instill some good habits in them. I mean, of course, yeah, like a lot of a lot of kids, they can, you know, be difficult or have attitudes, you know, but I think it's important to try to relate to them and just just be like, yeah, I know it's, this is a tough this is a tough age you know, that, that middle of the road age is a really difficult time because they're really just trying to figure themselves out and there's a lot of frustration, you know. So for me, it's my approach is, you know, I do my best to teach them what I know and that, you know, will hopefully allow them to grow into better players and, and, and people, you know, because mm -hmm. I, I think they need to, especially at that age, they need to have some as much positive, you know, reinforcement as possible. And, and especially in New York, they have a lot of pressures in, in, at that age, you know, as far as like testing and having to audition for high schools. And, you know, there's, there's just a lot of stresses that I feel like they have that I never really had to deal with growing up at that age. You know, you're when you're just really allowed to be a kid, they have a lot of a lot. I feel like they just have a lot more on their plates. So, you know, I want it to be a, a learning positive environment, but I also want it to be a fun experience for them. You know, yeah, sure, sure. What uh, what did you start on? You didn't start on baritone sax, did you? No, I started on the alto. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, technically, I started playing piano first, right? And then I switched to, well, I was still playing piano th all through, you know, my, you know, high school and, and all that. Um, but my older brother plays saxophone and I saw him playing the saxophone. I was like, I want to do that. That looks cool. <laughs> yeah. And that was, you know, I really just fell in love with it. And then I hit the point with the alto where I just was kind of, you know, feeling like it wasn't the right fit for me and at the suggestion of my teacher tried the baritone because he was mainly a, a baritone player my my um uh, my teacher in high school uh jeff lang and um i was like oh, the baritone i can carry that around like what <laughs> crazy you know <laughs> and he said you know, he's like, you have those teachers that just really get you, you know, but you don't know that they get you. <laughs> and he yeah. was one of those teachers to me. And he said, just, just try it. I think you're really going to, going to dig it. And I was like, okay. And literally the first three notes, I was like, I was hooked. I didn't even want to look at the alto, you know, yeah. <laughs> I'm done with that. Okay. The baritone it is. I'll be carrying this around the rest of my life. <laughs> the, the toy saxophone over there. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah these are the things they don't tell you about it you know like having to get it on the plane and all that stressful stuff but right. it's it's worth it as you know <laughs> uh rob viveros of robert's music in rhode island uh, sends his greetings he chimes in and says how much Hi. he likes the buffet berry and, and really digs your playing so rob thanks for joining us this afternoon. thank you um we've just got a few minutes left on today's together at home webcast with lauren sevian um, if you do have any questions you'd like to uh, ask Lauren, you can drop it in our comment section. We'll do our best to get to it in the time remaining that we have. Uh, Lauren, what's what's next for you? What's what's going on? Things are starting to loosen up a little bit around New York City. I know. Um, yeah. What what's going on with you? I guess personally, and then and musically, what do you have on deck? Well, um, the very next thing I have tomorrow, um, I'll be doing a Dizzy's Rewind. We'll be rebroadcasting the Lioness CD release party um, from last December from Dizzy's. So myself and Amanda Monaco, the guitarist, uh, two members, uh, the members of Lioness, will be with um, 
with uh, Uni Mojica and Raynell Frazier of uh, Jazz and Lincoln Center, and we'll be rebroadcasting one of the sets and having a nice chat that's on Facebook Live tomorrow night, Friday at 7.30. So if you're, you know, staying at home and want something to check out, please come and join us. It'll be a, a lot of fun. Um, so that's the very next thing I have coming up. Um, some teaching stuff. I'm, I'm uh, teaching at Manhattan School of Music. Um, you know, some uh, students online. Um, I've been actually working on some singing and writing lyrics. I've been rediscovering some music that I wrote many years ago um, that almost has more of like a pop feel to it. And I've been writing some lyrics. So just, you know, trying to get myself really way far out of my comfort zone of what I'm not programmed to do, but what I sort of expect myself to do. And I feel like it's having whether it's good or bad or ugly, I feel like it's having a really positive effect on my saxophone playing. So I've, you know, I've just been exploring those different things and, you know, trying to get not too crazy with all the, <laughs> what's happening in the world. Um, and, and, you know, enjoying the, the, the time that I have with, um, you know, my, my husband and my, my cat and uh, staying in shape you know trying to I'm, go running and play tennis and do I'm really disappointed are... your cat hasn't made an appearance <laughs> well the door is closed otherwise <laughs> she's she'd be coming in here meowing you know <laughs> like she it was funny because I was doing I was doing a um a, a another broadcast a couple of weeks ago and I had the door open I didn't know I thought I had closed the door and she came in and she was wow <laughs> super loud I was like uh. <laughs> like trying not to act affected at all you know <laughs> but yeah so I post plenty of pictures of her on Instagram so <laughs> well I think you know I think that's one of the beauties of these of these live broadcasts on the internet these webcasts is the fact that you have these unexpected things happen and I think yeah that, yeah it's fun <laughs> that's the charm of the webcast actually absolutely otherwise you know I think that's the thing we have to really you know keep in perspective is is just you know I almost find myself returning as much as possible to uh, like I had I don't know if I want to say like a childlike state but I'm really trying to just rediscover the wonder in everything you know whether it's being outside in nature or you know just really having the time to just like I don't feel so rushed now when I'm in my pra like my pra doing my practice routine you know if I spend an hour or two working on one thing I don't feel like oh I didn't get all the things done that I need to get done you know so I feel like again as as tragic as this whole pandemic has been I feel like it's teaching us really important life lessons you know and it's 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 asking us to examine and re-examine you know what's um, what's important to us in our lives so rediscovering like this um this curiosity and love that i have for music is you know has really been at the the forefront of that you know yeah. and also having the you know being able to step away and say like okay if i really don't feel like playing my horn today it's okay you know because there's just a lot going on in the in the world you know yeah well i think that's a great it's a great way of looking at it it's a great perspective is to is to find the opportunity in a situation like this yeah. you know as unusual and unprecedented as it is there are opportunities for growth and for discovery and and to appreciate things. And I, I think that's, that's a great way of looking at it. Yeah. Um, well, I've, we've got one more question before we wrap things up that, that Lori Orr posed earlier. Um, she really wants to know about playing in Dennis Leary's band. <laughs> that's and so fun. Dennis Leary, the, the famous <laughs> comedian and actor. And, and uh, when I found out years ago that you were playing in his band first of all i didn't even know he had a band <laughs> right and then the fact that he had a horn section so talk a little bit about about working with dennis leary well dennis is i mean he's super cool guy really just f 
funny and, and smart, you know, and you can, you just, you don't like when you're speaking to him, he doesn't ever make you feel like you're speaking to a celebrity. You're just kind of like, he's just like a regular person, you know? Um, but when he was doing his rescue me show, um, he was starting to do these comedy tours to promote the show. And he would have the different, um, different actors that were on the show as part of the, the comedy tour. And, um, he, you know, he, he wanted to have a, a backing band, you know, to play in between the different comedians. And one of the things that he said to his musical director, he said, I want to have an all female horn section, you know? And I, I just thought that was, you know, at first I think he thought it would be like this novelty type of, you know, like, oh, like, look at my, you know, horn section of all ladies. But then when he heard us play, he was like, whoa, you know, not to say like, oh, like, oh, some girls like, oh, they can actually play. But he was just gen he genuinely was appreciative of the fact that like, you know, you guys, you know, it, you just really elevate the whole thing, you know. And I was really is it it's really cool because it's it's nice to be in a in a situation where you know you're you're treated well and we had great so much fun fun times on the road and since uh the rescue me show when when that show ended every year we would still play these two benefits um the michael j fox um parkinson's foundation benefit and the cam neely foundation um foundation benefit in at the boston garden every year we would when, un, unfortunately it's not happening this year because of the pandemic but you know we would still have those two those two gigs so it was really nice to like get together and see everybody you know kind of like old friends um but it's just it's just a good time you know music is is super fun it's, it's all like rock and roll stuff so you're just you know really honking out some horn lines and having fun yeah yeah very cool um, before we wrap up, I want to invite our viewers to join us for some upcoming webcasts. We hope you'll join us next week as my colleague Warren Coos will be uh, joined by Hans Hoyer French horn artist Kelly Langenberg. They're going to be talking about efficient practice habits, which I think would be a really good topic for everyone to, to check out. And then on September 24th, which is in two weeks, um, we'll have Kristen Moore from Powell Flutes joining us. She will be joined by the entire flute section of the Cleveland Orchestra, and we'll have information yeah. on both of those. Uh, where, yeah, it's, it's going to be so a, cool. <laughs> exactly. So uh, we'll have information on both of those webcasts. You can find that on our New York Showroom Facebook page. Lauren, if people want to learn more about what you're up to, where can they go on the Internet? Um, you know, you could go to my website, um, laurensevian.com. Um, I'm also on Instagram. If you just search for Lauren Savion, I'll pop up. Um, Twitter, you know, all the social media platforms. I'm I'm pretty much on, you know, the Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Elbogie. <laughs> yeah, I try to. Um, I have a few pages on Facebook too, so I have a Lauren Savion page and also um, an LSAT page. It's a uh, quintet I co-lead with um, alto player uh, great Alexa Tarantino. Um, and also there's a lioness page. Um, yeah. So you can, you know, you can find me. <laughs> yeah. But there's a, a lot of good resources to learn more about Lauren. Lauren, it's always a pleasure talking to you. It's always a pleasure hearing you talk about saxophone and about life. Um, I look forward to the, to the time where we'll be able to get together in person again, yes. hopefully very soon. Same so. here, Matt. Thank you so much to you and everybody at Buffet. You guys are like family to me, and I, I really cherish our our friendship. So you. Th thank you for joining us, and you guys please stay healthy and safe. And we will see you next week for another Together at Home webcast. Thanks for tuning in this afternoon, everybody.